This is about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, and I think there's some good food for thought here about Satan and about the fact that he's not that bright. He has his own type of slyness and cunning, and we are susceptible to it when we exemplify or display similar, similar attributes as him. When we are prideful, we become susceptible to him, and that's where he can use his cunning against us. And the Lord here illustrates that beautifully, how worthless that is when you aren't consumed with pride and with what you're doing. He does this beautifully. So there's a scripture in chapter 4 of the book of Luke, and starting in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Just want to stay there for a second. He was led by the Spirit. Here's God in the flesh. Was he led by the law? Was he led by some commandment of a Pharisee? Was he, what was he led by? He was led by the Spirit. And this is like a preview of kind of how we are to live. Not, not that we are to be like Jesus as in be a copy of Jesus. But to follow him in the example of trusting in God. That's what he did perfectly. We're never going to do that perfectly. And that's okay. We're not supposed to. He did it perfectly. So I can look to him and never worry that if I do follow him in some way, that I'll make a mistake because I followed him. I'll make a mistake because I'm a human being and that's what we do. But I follow the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit. Not the leading of my religion or my denomination or any of it. It's the leading of the Spirit. Verse 2. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. That's the end of the sentence there. So just to read and flow. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry, as you can imagine. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now just think about that. If he really understood God, would he ask him such a question? For one thing, it shows he... The devil does have some understanding of who the Son of God is. He understands that the Son of God just means God in human form. And he assumes, because of, from his point of view, well, if I was God in human form, I would just turn stones into bread. So, he's asking him to prove something like to his satisfaction, so that he can see if he believes that he's the Son of God. You see that the pride he has involved here, He's going to determine something by whether or not this person does what he tells him to do. Because, well, that's what I would do. Because we see the devil's view of what it is to be God. He says, I will be as the Most High. And the way he describes that in uh, Isaiah 14, I think it is, he talks about just looking down at everybody and, and ready to squash everyone, destroy everyone, which is... Not so ironically enough, pretty much a kind of a religious view of who God is. In a lot of ways, religion views God the same way that the devil does. So he challenges him to prove himself, which is another thing. I'm sorry to say if you're religious, but we ask God to prove himself all the time. And a lot of people live their lives believing that they, they prove God, they test him. And, and that shows their faith and his goodness somehow. But I just don't see it that way. Moving on to verse 4, Jesus responds, says, But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, this is a paraphrase or a quote of Deuteronomy 8, I think it's verse 3, part of that verse. In that verse, it's about God humbling the people. He humbled them. He caused them to be hungry. They were hungry for a while. And then he brought the manna from heaven. And it's pretty neat because the very bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven, the 
bread that is God that came here to save us. God himself came as the bread of life. Is being challenged by the accuser, by the tempter here. So he quotes this verse, part of this verse, and I want to focus on the word alone. He says, man, man shall not live by bread alone. We do need bread. He's acknowledging that. I need bread. And, and also the word live. So I can live by bread alone, as in my temporal life here, but I believe God is always making reference to, if not directly, then indirectly, in terms of the eternal. So he's talking about, I'm concerned with the eternal life. You're saying, hey, if you're the Son of God, prove it and feed yourself. Feed your, feed your flesh. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus is saying, that's not my concern. I haven't eaten for 40 days. I'll eat when I want to eat. But my concern is with eternal life. And besides, it's not bread alone. It's by every word of God. So the word of God brought that manna. Jesus himself, the word of God. He brought the manna. He brought the bread from heaven that they ate. That the people ate. And they lived. It sustained them in that temporal sense. But it's every word of God that we are to live by, as in have eternal life. And unfortunately, those people, they did not live. They did not live. And he made that clear in John chapter 6 when he went through that whole sequence of explaining to them how he was the bread of life. And he said, your fathers ate that manna in the desert and they are dead. I think he was telling us something there because he didn't say... That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive because they ate the true bread. They had faith in their God. They trusted in the Word of God, Jesus Christ. That's why they are alive to this day. They were alive then as well. He made that clear. He's the God of the living. He is not the God of the dead. Satan is the God of the dead. People who trust in him and want to feed their bellies, whose God is their bellies and all that like Paul referred to. So he's, he's saying several very deep statements here. Man shall not live eternally by bread alone. Even though we get that bread. I get my bread from the Word of God. If not for the Word of God, I don't eat. Because he spoke all this into existence, including myself and my belly. But that's not my eternal life. It's every word that proceeds from the mouth of God that I live by. As in the life that I have that will continue on forever. Verse 5, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Now again, I believe the devil is sincere here. He believes this. talks about powers and principalities, principalities and powers, that's mentioned several times, and it's about spiritual wickedness in high places and all that. And it still says, it makes it clear, Paul did in Romans chapter 13, that there's no authority except that which is given by God. So even to the extent that Satan had some authority to give it to someone else, it was by God. God determined that. There is no authority above his authority. So if he wants to let someone else have it, He's letting them have it. So technically, Satan was right here, but not from his point of view. His point of view was, I have it and I give it. Well, God lets you give it, he will. But he's talking to God. And that goes to the whole point here. He doesn't really believe because he wants proof to his satisfaction because he doesn't know what he needs. Because he's not, he doesn't, he couldn't get it anyway. He's already doomed. But you and I live in a time where we can become aware of what we really need and then seek it out and embrace it. We need mercy. We need mercy. Satan is without hope. He had his chance and he blew it. But you and I, we have this hope. We have a hope and we can embrace it and we can put our hope in it. In the, the only hope that is fulfilled by our God himself, by giving himself for us. So when he says... For this has been delivered to me. Like I say, that's true, but not because he has it to keep or he has it to any power of his own. 
it also talks about in Hebrews that they're ministering spirits. These ministering spirits, God uses the demons and the devil himself to accomplish things that he wants to accomplish. I always like to give the example when they they put that that sign over the Lord's head on the cross, they thought they were mocking him, but instead they were actually identifying him. And it goes to the whole problem with the devil and his ego and how he really is stupid. He really is stupid. He's stupid, dumb, and blind. He just doesn't know it. So he goes on to say, Therefore, if you will worship me before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So how else could he say this without blaspheming, unless he himself was God? He says, Get behind me, Satan. I can't tell Satan to get behind me. Tell him to get behind Jesus. But I don't worry about it because I'm not responding to my pride or whatever Satan is going to try to appeal to me. He'll appeal to my fear. He'll appeal to my pride. He'll appeal to all the things that God has not given me. God has not given me a spirit of fear. God has cast that out with His love, His perfect love. And I may be challenged. I may be... I may even break at some point if I was faced with the devil, but not from, again, not from that eternal sense, because I have partaken of the bread of life. I have eternal life. My flesh can fail. I can be faithless, but I don't have to worry, because he remains faithful no matter what. I can make mistakes in this life, in this world, in this flesh, with temporal consequences, but my eternal fate is already sealed in him, because I trusted in him. Not in my endurance to the end. His endurance. He trusted to the end. And he proves it here. Because he doesn't, he doesn't call Satan a liar. He doesn't say, you don't have any of that stuff. Because apparently he does. Like I say, I'll put the scripture in a drop down. But Paul made it clear in Romans 13. There's no authority but that which is given of God. There's these principalities and powers. God lets them do what he lets them do. But it's ultimately him that lets them do it. So they're not doing it on their own. They're doing it by his authority. Not because he necessarily wants to do it. I just want to make that clear too. People say, oh God's evil because he lets these things happen. No, he has his own purpose. And it's an eternal purpose, not temporal. We don't always understand it. But it has an eternal good. That's where it, it, faith comes in. And it's important to believe and to seek to understand that there is something beyond your understanding. And trust in that. That the eternal God has eternal goals that are worth trusting in, even though you don't get all of them all the time. But I just wanted to highlight that, that the devil doesn't really even believe who he's talking to because he didn't do, as the Lord didn't do what he wanted him to do because of what he thought you would do if you were God in the flesh. Because that's what he would do. And that's what we shouldn't be seeking for God to do. We shouldn't be seeking for him to do all these miracles and things to, to bless our flesh and bless our temporal lives. If he wants to do that, he'll do it. It's up to him. But we already have everything we need. We don't need him to prove anything to us. We have all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. What else do you need? You have Jesus. Like I said in a, a, another video recently, if, you, if your God is someone who hasn't given you everything, you need another God. That's not, by any definition I understand, a, a true God. Our God has given us himself, which is everything. In Jesus' name, amen.